uh, is um, I've made a slight adjustment to the title, The Trouble with Research on Radicalization and Violent Extremism. And it's going to focus on three or four uh, issues I would like to bring our attention uh, to. The first is um, the circumstances of research on radicalization and violent extremism. Uh, the second one is uh, to point to some of the, I think, neglected aspects of, uh, uh, of, of this research. Uh, the third one uh, would be uh, the securitization of extremism in particular violent extremism. So this strategy of securitization and how, uh, how referring or labeling something as being extremist uh, then uh, served, uh, has an important legitimating function. And the fourth element, uh, I think, which is important, and I think this, uh, uh, this symposium is, uh, I think, a testament to that, is the need to, uh, for some interdisciplinarity in uh, the area of, uh, uh, of research. So taking inter interdisciplinarity seriously, not as some sort of an alibi, which is most often the case. So what are the circumstances of research on radicalization and violent extremism? Professor Richard Jackson talked a little, a little bit about that earlier uh, this morning or afternoon for him. Uh, so we, we are not, when doing research on a, sense, on a topic sensitive as uh, terrorism, radicalization and violent extremism is that we have different other phenomena which, are, which we might take into account when doing research on that. And the one, uh, uh, let's say, obvious example is fake news. The other one is related to populism. So those are, those are I think, uh, sensitive topics uh, or uh, controversial issues as some, uh, some might claim in philosophy of education, which I think we should bring in when thinking about uh, radicalization and violent extremism, in, in, in particular also in the educational environment. The, another one is, uh, let's say, the issue related to political correctness. Then again, um, Another uh, issue is moral panic. So like Laura was saying, the instrumentalization of fear that we have and uh, Nanat was talking about was uh, populist uh, entrepreneurship, which is right here. So that uh, there is someone taking advantage of, uh, of this phenomenon. And I think one of the uh, most important one is the one referred to uh, uh, to Winston Churchill, the riddle uh, inside, you know, wrapped up uh, in a mystery inside an enigma. So what, uh, what is a particular phenomenon? So we've been talking uh, much, a lot this, this morning and this afternoon on one particular concept, and this is the concept of extremism. So it's a complete, uh, it's a definitely a very, uh, very complex and even some may claim a controversial one. So let's say these are the basic circumstances related to radicalization and violent extremism. And one thing which I got an idea out of an interview with Professor Donatella de la Porta, uh, which some of you may know, she's a social scientist working at the, um, uh, at the uh, University of Florence, talking about helicopter money being thrown at uh, on uh, research on radicalization, violent extremism, and terrorism. That this is somehow the, the that this is not just a positive only phenomenon, but because also of the dubious intentions by those throwing helicopter money at uh, at research being done on this. So I think these all these elements are something we, we need to pay attention uh, to. So what, um, mm, so one thing I think which is important here again is um, the conceptual confusion. And one, I'm taking the example of radicalization, but it does not refer exclusively to radicalization. As we'll see later, it refers also to extremism. And the first one, so we have two, uh, so we, we have basically two basic questions leading our research. And the first one is conceptual, what is? We've basically started uh, this morning's session with the question, the conceptual one, so what is extremism? And the second one uh, is what makes radicalization or extremism uh, problematic? 
I think um, what uh, what time and again we um, we see in the research on radicalization and violent extremism is that the security and intelligence industry somehow hits the target but misses the point. And I think of the previously mentioned uh, uh, fundamental British values uh, element of prevent is, I think, a case uh, a case in point. And one of the main aims of this symposium were actually to emphasize uh, the, the element of conceptual analysis in making sense of all the different concepts in this gravitational orbit of what is being uh, related to radicalization uh, and uh, violent extremism. So what, um, what we see here is that um, uh, this is not only radicalization, but I think the whole uh, the whole field is uh, plagued by assumption and intuitions uh, dominated by uh, co the conventional wisdom. And I think uh, we have uh, three, uh, three related um, elements here, rhetorical elements. One are the slogans, the metaphors, and thought terminating cliches. So way too, way too many times has uh, research on radicalization and violent extremism being uh, somehow hampered by uh, by by this conventional wisdom about radic both radicalization and violent extremism, and um, what we see here by several scholars is that um, it, it's actually twenty years since uh, 9/11 this September that we still face some some of the. Uh, some of the basic conceptual homework needing uh, to be done. So um, either uh, by Rick Colset or by Noman. So uh, both uh, emphasizing that there is, uh, you know, we still face several uh, problems related to uh, the important conceptual issues to be tackled. But I think what we need to emphasize is that this conceptual confusion, it has two possible interpretations, which I think can be useful for, for a future work on uh, in this uh, area. Uh, we have the optimistical interpretation and the skeptical or the pessimistic one. Uh, so uh, the optimistical would, uh, would claim that conceptual confusion is, you know, obviously an uh, the outcome of the complex nature of the phenomenon. So if you're talking about radicalization, the, the distinction between be uh, 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 cognitive, behavioral, and so on, and um, uh, the staircase to terrorism and so on. So different models, uh, this, is why, uh, this is why this is important. This is the optimistical interpretation saying that uh, the, phenomenon is, the phenomenon is so complex that no wonder we face so many, uh, so many uh, problems. Another one, which I think this symposium is a testament of, has been that the gravitational orbit of concepts floating, I mean, uh, being around uh, this phenomenon is, uh, is, very, is very wide. So we have fear, we have terror, we have security, we have indoctrination, we have polarization, we have conflicting diversity, we have violence, we have extremism. So this is why, but this would be, I think, the optimistic interpretation, although complex enough. I think uh, what is, uh, I think, more, uh, more problematic is the skeptical interpretation, which says that this conceptual confusion is actually the deliberate outcome of the war on terror. So this is, and um, it's not me claiming exclusively this, but I think uh, it's, uh, it's been uh, argued by several other uh, uh, colleagues. Arun Kundani uh, uh, writes that confusion is an outcome of the institutional uses to which the term has been put. In these settings, the function of the term is to conceal as much as to reveal to obscure as much as to, uh, 
to elucidate. So this, when doing research in this area of scholarly research, we have, uh, we are faced by that, that uh, conceptual confusion is actually, or might actually be a deliberate outcome of, uh, of a particular strategy by the war on terror. Uh, uh, like Stephen Nathanson wrote, I think in his book, uh, the, the Ethics of Terrorism, is uh, he writes that clarity is not everyone's goal because confusion can, can be politically useful. And I think we, what we face with in particular when moving from uh, the conceptual to the policy or uh, the practical uh, level, let's say the educational level, uh, this is, I think, uh, an important observation we need to uh, we need to take into account when doing research on education. Another one which I've labeled the disconnection problem is that uh, was emphasized by uh, uh, by Mark Sajman, who writes about um, who writes writes about and does uh, does research on terrorism, in particular empirical research. And I think this is, I think, a very useful um, uh, quotation from him that the intelligence community knows everything about terrorism, but understands nothing. And on the other hand, the academics understand everything, but know nothing about it. So this is, I think, uh, that the two, that the two uh, sides of the coin are somehow not uh, connected with, uh, with uh, one another. And I think in particular, uh, when we uh, when we look at the security and intelligence industry, uh, or even at the policy level, we see time and again that um, the conceptual aspect, or what might be the effects of a particular policy, have not been, I think, well thought through. So, how to overcome this uh, uh, this sort of uh, 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 problem? Uh, the empirical level would have an obvious uh, research, the empirical level would have an obvious uh, answer, and it would be that uh, radicalized individuals or extremist individuals are members of hard to reach groups. So I don't know whether there is anybody uh, of us who knows a terrorist, perhaps. So these are members of hard to reach groups. And the other one is uh, the shortage of evidence that the data on terrorism is mostly uh, classified. So we have, this, uh, we have this, let's say, empirical problem. But then it, there is another one, which I think points to that, is that our practical failure, like Richard English write, uh, writes in his book on terrorism, that uh, our main problem is basically that we haven't done that the homework at uh, the conceptual level hasn't been done well enough. And this is why uh, the empirical research is somehow uh, lack, lacking in effectiveness and efficiency. So I think I would, I would agree with that, uh, uh, with that uh, position because I think time and again uh, it shows, and I think uh, today's symposium has been a testament to that there is important uh, uh, conceptual um, work in need to, to be done, let's say either on radicalization like Professor Bufacci was uh, talking about, either in, at the discursive level like Rita Floyd and Boris Vezek were talking about, uh, on, uh, when talking about terrorism like Friedrich, or polarization like uh, uh, Nenat or extremism like Professor Kassam uh, uh, Michael and Laura then on uh, on fear. So I think uh, by clarifying those uh, those concepts, but also putting them in context with uh, and aligning them uh, with other concepts, I think concepts I think has has considerable value, not only theoretically but also I think practically. Because we'll I, I'll show uh, uh, at the very end what I think is uh, important when we talk about, let's say, the educational uh, level. So um, Professor Mogadam, uh, I hope, I still hope he will join us, uh, was, is talking about a lack of powerful conceptual frameworks. And Richard Jackson uh, 
who was with us uh, earlier this morning uh, talked about uh, talks about or writes about the de definitional uh, deficiency and I, I i'm taking as an example of this is the case of extremism or violent extremism professor kasam and several following him uh, uh uh, earlier today have uh, have made this example and this is why I think is uh, it's interesting um, I think uh, the the label of uh, being extremist is um, is an important one and um, as a vague concept like Arun Kundnani is saying is that it is easily manipulated to demonize anyone whose opinion are radically different. I think when doing, uh, when writing about extremism, this is an important uh, observation. And uh, there are two projects uh, at the Robert Schumann Center uh, for Advanced Studies in Florence, which actually emphasize again, this uh, conceptual level related to, to issues that are part of this gravitational orbit, terrorism, extremism, uh, radicalization, fear, and uh, uh, and so on. So um, polarization and so on. So these are these are the important uh, these are the important uh, uh, issues. So um, extremism, uh, like any ism, uh, has this um, semantic core interpretation. Like, for example. Um, mm, that uh, this interpretation helps us in getting uh, getting some sort of what does it mean? For example, patriotism meaning love of patria, but definitely it is much more uh, complex than that. And the same applies uh, to extremism. So extremism is not just related to you know opposition being extremist, but uh, has uh, as Professor Kassam was. Uh, uh, was telling uh, uh, earlier, uh, lecturing earlier today, is uh, much more complex. So uh, it is uh, also contextually dependent because um, let's say something being out of the ordinary, eccentric, unorthodox, but primarily I think extremism can be instrumentalized uh, to denote that something deviates from the mainstream. And I think it sort of uh, relates to the balance between the mainstream and what is being extreme. I think this is an important, uh, uh, this is an important dynamics uh, in research on extremism and violent extremism. Another thing which I think is important when doing, when, uh, analyzing uh, the concept of extremism is uh, the criteria we use. Uh, I've taken these three criteria out of, a, out of a, an article uh, written by Michael, Michael Hent uh, on controversial issues. And because I think it shows, it may, it may not be the best possible, um, the best possible criteria, but it gives us a sense of, um, of how uh, using different criteria to define something as extremist can then lead to different results. Uh, and let us look uh, to the three criteria. So the behavioral criterion would be to label something as being uh, related to the disagreement over a particular position. Uh, the political would be uh, that it this extremist position deviates from the dem dominant values, beliefs, or ideas. I think uh, this has been successfully manipulated by, in particular, by several political parties, uh, not only in Europe, but in, let's say, by, uh, by the former US President Donald Trump and so on. So I think this, uh, what counts as being extremist, what kind of criteria we use, I think is important. So, for example, what is being uh, extremist in the UK prevent case, uh, in particular, the fundamental British values, vocal or active opposition to fundamental British values, including democracy, the rule of law, individual freedom, mutual respect and tolerance. So I think we'll, we'll, we'll look at this uh, quotation once again later on. I think this is an interesting uh, case uh, when, uh, when this is being uh, referred to, because 
it says what? It says that uh, democracy, individual freedoms and toleration, let's take the three of them, may not be, may not be, are sort of unquestionable. And as we know from today's presentations, but also in general, uh, all of the three uh, are considerably complex and not only compl complex, but also controversial. But referring to something by using these criteria uh, somehow sweeps away this, uh, these potential uh, problems, which are part of the, allegedly part of the, uh, the mainstream. Uh, the third criteria which, uh, 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 which I'm using is the ep epistemic criterion uh, used to define something as like extremist. And um, I think, and what I'm interested in is the negative side effect of a particular criteria we use. Uh, at least Michael in his uh, article on uh, the teaching of controversial issues refers this criteria to refer to something as being controversial as the most adequate, perhaps, out of the three, the behavioral, political, and um, epistemic. But I think uh, that uh, even these, the best possible criteria out of the three may have some unintended negative side effects. And this is what I think is important in general when conducting conducting research on radicalization and violent extremism. So what are the negative unintended side effects of a particular, let's say, allegedly positive, uh, 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 positive endeavor or policy or practical, or practical uh, issue? So uh, uh, what we see here is that uh, we have this sort of uh, moral uh, entrepreneurship that um, time and again we uh, we have this problem that uh, this labeling of something being extremist uh, somehow uh, instrumentalizes uh, this um, this concept and this uh, and this strategy. So what I'm following Professor Kassam's uh, 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 work. Uh, is the, so what we need to pay attention to when we're defining extremism. So um, the modality element. So uh, um, what is the relationship of the individual to, to his own beliefs? So in what way he refers to his own uh, uh, beliefs? The second one would be the nature of extremism because uh, extremism does not necessarily have to be exclusively negative. Uh, another one uh, emphasized by Professor Kassam is the methodological dimension. So is extremism problematic because of the methods being used? I think an element which somehow links um, uh, extremism, extremism also to what Boris was presenting this morning with uh, 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 Islamophobia and um, uh, and um, uh, yeah about Islamophobia um, and the anti-Semitic um, sentiment was that with the example of the Second World War uh, that one may be an extremist in one sphere but uh, let's say in quotation normal in another one. So for example, that how, how uh, a loving father could be, let's say in a home environment, can be a Nazi war criminal in a concentration camp. So I think this is also uh, an important element, I think when we, uh, when doing, so the, those were the cases from uh, Second World War that how uh, those, let's say, monstrous uh, issues were being done by, let's say, normal family, uh, family guys. So that would, be, uh, that would be, I think, another important dimension, perhaps being in need to be, uh, in need to be uh, emphasized. And also uh, the relationship between uh, different uh, spheres. So what I'm, um, what I, yeah, I basically used all my time. Uh, what I would like to skip now to is um, to the, just let me see. Uh, yeah, to, um, to my, actually, those are the fundamental British values, uh, two slides. 
which I sort of covered uh, before, is that uh, by labeling something that is, as extremist, we sort of normalize what is in need of further, not only further elucidation, but are concepts which are essentially contested. And this is individual rights, for example, freedom of expression, like Rita was, uh, was uh, talking about earlier today, uh, or liberty in general, toleration, for example, that we take it, that we somehow eliminate uh, the, let's say, the uh, controversiality of toleration, because toleration is for several, uh, not only academics, but for several, let's say, politicians or political parties even, uh, toleration may be part of the problem and not the solution. The toleration is actually uh, part, of, uh, part of the problem for the problems we, we actually face. Uh, so I think this, this is, I think, uh, an important issue which needs to be emphasized when doing research on uh, radicalization and violent extremism. And uh, the concluding uh, slide is this one. So uh, what I think uh, so far hasn't been addressed very well uh, in this area of scholarly research is that um, the challenge of the conceptual inflation uh, we face time and again. Time and again, we want to be as sensitive as possible, for example, in defining violence in order to encompass all the empirical forms of uh, violence, we, we may try and do as, a comprehens as comprehensive as uh, possible a definition, definition, but then somehow we get stuck with several negative side effects. So by being, uh, so do we not face uh, other problems which are then related to that? For example, the instrumentalization of fear, or that by blending all the different forms of violence together, we basically lose sight of the of any distinction within the particular uh, uh, forms forms of violence. So I think the task of research in this area of scholarly research, like radicalization, violent extremism, and terrorism in general, uh, I think. Uh, faces a number of tasks. The first one, basically conceptual one, but I think the second one, uh, those doing uh, conceptual uh, work, is to pay attention to how all these uh, distinctions and so on and are then translated at the policy uh, and as well as the uh, practical level, for example, at the level of education. So, yeah, very briefly, that would be uh, that would be uh, uh, my presentation. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So a uh, sort. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, a couple of colleagues applauded. Thank you. Uh, I'm in this. Uh, I, I, I'm in this. Um, position of uh, being the moderator and the presenter, but uh, the good thing is that I've seen that there is someone who joined us, uh, luckily, uh, Professor Fatali Mugadam. So I don't know whether there is any question uh, before giving the floor to him. So what I wanted to do is that is, is, to, is to point out the different problems we have with, uh, uh, with research being conduct, conducted on this topic. It may be part of the sensitivity of all the issues related to that, but I think it's also uh, part of the uh, deliberate strategy used by, uh, used by uh, let's say, uh, the war on terror and so on. So uh, thank you very much.